afternoon and a very warm welcome to everybody for joining us in the, this event in which we're doing in Berlin. Um, and we're doing it in, in collaboration with the Oxford University Environmental Change Institute. I'm really happy to do this event, um, a combination of policy, practice and research in partnership with my former university, my, my former institution, the, the UN, I was there for 30 years, and also with um, the Adelphi Foundation, our friend and partner here in Berlin on many issues. This event for us is, is one of the last in our series of our 50th anniversary. Um, we've had a half a century of work on conflict transformation in many parts of the world, but only in the past two years have we started to link that to environmental degradation and climate change. And we are, as we see that these are increasingly important uh, factors in, in the work we do. And anyway, so we are working on this, um, particularly in Somalia and in Iraq, um, in cooperation with a large number of institutions and with the support generously of the, the German Foreign Office and uh, the Norwegians, the Swedes and, and others, and the EU. Um, and we, we see this, as being ever more important uh, as it makes uh, populations, particularly in conflict areas, ever more vulnerable. And it's often, uh, climate change is often a factor in environmental degradation with droughts and floods. But human activity also, it, it is, it's not just climate change that creates environmental degradation. We, we see it in the context of bad land, land management or bad water management, and also, of course, in the context of war. And particularly right now, we see in Ukraine desperate ecological damage. Sometimes there's a deliberate, uh, as a deliberate effect, or as we see bombed out chemical or industrial or, or nuclear facilities and the dangers of leakage and really serious damage. And increasingly, there is talk of the term ecocide, uh, including from the Ukrainian Prosecutor General's office. So, Today's event uh, comes within two weeks of the closing of the COP climate meeting in, in Sharm el Sheikh, and just a few days before the, the Montreal Biodiversity COP15, uh, both of which are extremely relevant. So I would very much, just as, I mean, of course, with the, with the um, environmental degradation being so linked to biodiversity loss. And we are honored to have, really honored to have actually, as our first speaker today, um, Andrea Meza Morello, who is the Deputy Executive Secretary of the UN Convention for, to Combat Desertification and the former Minister of Energy and uh, Environment in Costa Rica. Um, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew, and, and thank you to the Berghoff Foundation for convening this event. I think in a very timely moment, as you mentioned, uh, we just passed COP27. We are going and heading to um, the negotiation of, of the post-2020 biodiversity framework. And we know, and, and I hope that this conversation will bring us um, views, uh, energy, and generate momentum on the importance of having a very robust, ambitious post-2020 framework, because we're talking about our uh, well human beings, uh, about having a safer space for us. Uh, nature doesn't uh, need us. We are the ones who need nature. And, and I think that it's so critical to understand this that it's so critical for our economies, for our societies. Uh, but bringing to the elements that we're discussing, climate change, environmental degradation, and conflict. And, um, and I would like to start by saying that this combined challenge that we have of an increasing population, which means more demand on la land-based uh, resources, and also the impacts of, of climate change. And particularly, I would like to bring your attention on drought. Uh, the impacts and this combination, what we have on food and water security, uh, it's no doubt uh, jeopardizing human security. Um, so I, I want to really bring the attention on these elements that when we have these environmental threats combined with weak economies, 
poor governance and political systems, uneven distribution of our global resources, then we have a perfect storm to generate instability. Um, then we are seeing, and what we consider is that uh, land degradation and climate change both are underlying drivers or amplifiers of poverty, of hunger, of migration, and then of conflict. Um, and, and why? Why, does, does, why do we come with this uh, particular analysis? And it's because when we come and understand that land degradation refers to the loss of productivity and ability of land resources. And this means at the end of soil and water, then we can really start connecting the dots. The scarcity of soil and water directly impacts food security and human health. When we destroy soil, we have less productivity and also we have a worse quality of our food. And then we are creating these scenarios of lower yields and incomes. And then we can also be generating a scenarios where we have this rising of food prices. And we know what happens when we have these scenarios of rising of food prices. We can have food riots. And we have seen this in several moments of our history. So it's also important to understand that land degradation also generates water scarcity because we reduce uh, the uh, water availability, the quality of water, and also the capacity of storage, uh, of being a storage in water. And, and then when we have these elements and we come with a specific numbers, and, and let me give you some of these numbers. For example, that by 2030, up to 700 million could be at risk of being displaced due to drought issues, alarms, just elements, and, and seeing this, these aspects. By 2050, about half of the population and 50% of global grain production will be exposed to severe water scarcity. So we're just seeing that um, we will have an increased competition over this uh, natural resources, and we know and we understand that we have more, competi more competition over these natural resources, then we will have, um, this can intensify and exacerbate existing tensions that we have within uh, a country, between communities, um, between countries, uh, between the rural and urban spaces, and, and also uh, we will be then having these drivers for migration uh, and potentially contributing to crime and extremism. And we have some examples, I will say, where, where we are seeing this uh, interrelated aspects. Um, we have seen, for example, and we're seeing what's going on um, in Haiti, where uh, forest cover has been reduced from 60% to 2% in the country. And this has uh, significantly, significantly increased the vulnerability uh, to rapid on, onset disasters, such as landslides and flooding, but also to the slow onset environmental degradation, such as drought and soil erosion, and the loss of productive land. But we are seeing also what's going on in the, what we're calling in, in Central America. You know, I'm from Costa Rica, so this is very close to my heart and, and what I'm really seeing. And, uh, and, and we have an area that it is called the, the dry corridor, right? That goes from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, even at Nicaragua and, and the Northern Pacific side of Costa Rica. And, and we are seeing there as well that uh, it's an area right now with water scarcity. It's an area that where around 40% um, or 80% of the families that live there in, the, in this dry corridor live right now in food insecurity. And then we, we start in this cycle of continuing uh, this land degradation process and then we are seeing what's going on with the migration 
with uh, those big people going to the U.S. looking for better lives and all the conflicts that are having within these communities and, and all this vulnerable uh, population. And, and again, um, this is just a, a very complex scenario considering this other aspect that up to 40% of the land today is already degraded, affecting 3 billion people in the world. And, uh, and that we know that if we continue in this, I will call it suicidal trend, right? If we continue with this same development model, if we continue destroying nature and destroying land, um, another 24 billion tons of fertile soil uh, will be continued to be lost yearly, yearly. And, and this is linked right now to the current agricultural practices that we have. So this is just to, to come and have, yes, the scenario is complex. And if we add the impacts of climate change uh, and, bio, and biodiversity loss, then we have this perfect storm. But the good part, the good story is that we can change this. And, and investing in land restoration and bringing um, that aspect of having a balance in the way that we need to do some conservation, some sustainable use, but and also some restoration of, of our land, land based resources, then uh, it is giving us a great opportunity. And we are seeing very good examples of citizens, of communities, of countries that are doing this all over the world again. And we have um, one good initiative there in the, in the Sahel, what we're calling the, the, calling the Great Ring Wall, and, and also an initiative uh, called Sustainability, Stability, and Security, the 3S initiative where we are seeing that when we're talking about land restoration and supporting a small farmers to adopt this uh, generative practices, uh, we are helping them to protect their asset land in many of the cases and for many of these communities is the only asset that they have. And uh, then we can generate more resilience and uh, protect their livelihoods in many ways. And, and it's through this kind of initiatives that it's not only about uh, planting trees, this is more than that. It's about also uh, changing some agricultural patterns, bringing more technology to this, um, increasing the efficiency in water use and, and generating at the end what we're calling a lot of these green jobs then we can really transform many lives. And, and the vision around the Great Green Wall, for example, is about restoring 1 million hectares of degraded land by 2030, but also creating 10 million jobs. And, and I would like to also see that this is at the end all linked. And, and just to close this, that and, and we were starting our uh, background conversation, Andrew, about bringing that human rights-based approach, which is critical to all this agenda. At the end, it's about understanding that yes, this transformational change that we need to be carbon neutral, to be net zero emissions and nature positive by 2050, we can do it, but we need to have a, a just transition and we need to have this human rights-based approach in the heart of all these uh, proposals. Over to you. Well, thank you so much, Andrea. The very, you paint uh, an understandably big picture in terms of land degradation, but also it, it's good to hear um, some words of hope as well. Um, we, we, and, and, and the Great Green Wall is absolutely central. Would you just maybe give another example of, of a good, of, of a good sort of solution to this problem, uh, specifically where environmental degradation leads to insecurity and what one might do to to mitigate that. Sure, and, and I will um, bring that these, um, we're working right now also again in, in this area of the dry corridor because we're having a big demand coming from the countries right now, right? And, and a little bit understanding what are some of these rural communities, what are their needs? Because in some, um, in many of the cases, it's not only about 
uh, having and transferring technologies so they can manage better their, their, their small property, their farms, their, um, to be restoring their land. But it's also in many times to have access to electricity, to energy, to water. And it's about at the end, uh, I will say, understanding that we're talking about having um, an integrated approach that it's about a development pathway. It's about a development model. So what we're trying to do in many of these cases as well is come with this kind of, of, of a more systemic uh, um, approaches. Not only, we're, we're, we're not saying that this is not only about environment, it's about generating this balance, um, access to certain services, and at the same time, put in the environment as part of this development conversation. So it's that, it's not only an environmental agenda, it's, it's about what kind of development do we want to bring to a lot of these areas. And as you were saying and noticing, in many of the areas that we have this uh, conflict and this uh, degradation, this environmental degradation, where we're having a structural uh, challenges that of poverty, of lack of, of, of services, and, and it's that if we need when we go there, when we try and we, when we, have, we, are, we are having these conversations with the small farmers, uh, we know that it's not only about the environmental part, that we also need to come with the more systemic approach and conversation to generate more resilience and to, and to see the changes that we need to, to see there. And at the end, this is a little bit part of, of the elements that we're doing right now in many areas. Okay. Thank you so much, Andre. Much appreciated. Um, Professor Michael Oshliner, thank you so much for co-organizing this with us. Uh, Michael is the director of the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford University. Um, he's written 250, um, a staggering number of scientific papers. And um, his research experience stretches from biophysical modeling in the areas of ecosystems, forestry and agriculture to economics, finance and, and much else. Michael, um, how, how do you see the relationship between climate change and environmental degradation? And is there, what is the, what is, how does one drive the other in your opinion? Yeah, well, uh, Andrew, thank you very much to, to do this together. It's, uh, it's a great privilege for us. And uh, let me say that this is also very strategic for us because uh, as the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford University, we were uh, looking at the environmental change as, you know, it, as a change phenomenon. But we are now more and more strategically transitioning towards impacts and wider societal impacts. And uh, conflict is something that has been on our radar for quite some time, uh, but something we really want to, to, to look into uh, more, more carefully. So, so, so thank you again for, for, for this initiative. Um, just uh, to, to your question, um, uh, I think overall this, this nexus between climate change and environmental degradation is, is quite well established. You know, we have the IPCC did assessments on this. We have uh, IPBES, so this is basically, the, if you want, the IPCC of the, uh, of the CBD, but also uh, uh, Andrea's outfit uh, also quite, uh, did quite some work on this. And even the International Resource Panel, we just uh, recently launched uh, a report on migration and environmental degradation. So, so here, this is an active field of, uh, of, uh, of research. And uh, and probably you know you don't only have to consult literature. You just go out into nature and have a look yourself. And uh, even even when you walk uh, in uh, in Germany uh, uh, or in uh, in the UK here, you actually see environmental degradation 
uh, enhanced by climate change everywhere. You know, you see uh, soil uh, soil being depleted, uh, not only from climate change per se. So, for example, soil carbon uh, is depleted simply because of temperature changes, because the microbes become more active and, uh, and deplete soil carbon. But we also see, uh, you know, more, more and more severe uh, rainfall events, for example, which uh, erode the soil uh, and uh, leading to soil degradation and the loss of fertility. And Andrea mentioned already the, the, the consequences that uh, go, go further on. So, so here that there is uh, a lot uh, known and can be seen already on the local scale. However, also on the macro scale, uh, on larger phenomena, we see climate change kicking in uh, more and more. So uh, we are just going to publish, hopefully it will come out uh, in uh, two, three weeks in, in Nature, a, a paper where... Uh, we see the global carbon sink from uh, uh, natural ecosystems has been increasing quite a lot due to uh, CO2 fertilization. However, now we see that uh, climate change per se is probably superseding this uh, fertilization effect from, from CO2 fertilization. And we see really early warnings of uh, uh, larger scale breakdown of the carbon sink capacity of, uh, of large uh, ecosystems. One of which uh, where the, 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 we have a publication already is, is the Amazon. So the Amazon, has uh, started to be more volatile in terms of its carbon uh, uh, absorptive capacity, which is mostly due to, um, you know, uh, physiological changes, but also uh, due to um, uh, 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 breakdown of uh, of ecosystems uh, overall, such that they go from uh, a, a vital state to a much less uh, less vital state. Um, but there is also uh, quite a lot of theory of the stability, for example, of the of the Amazon, where if we continue with deforestation and compound it by climate change the ecosystem might actually go from a rainforest system into a, a, a step uh, dryland kind of system, which has been observed uh, in, in the earth history. But uh, due to climate change and degradation together, we might actually uh, be not very far away from a, a tipping point. Uh, and this would have not only regional effects uh, in, in Brazil, and uh, uh, you know, Brazil is, the, is one of the agricultural powerhouses that also uh, feeds the rest of the world. So, so this would be a, a major, major impact. And, uh, and so here we are looking not only at uh, local effects, but really um, larger systems effects. And of course, with this degradation uh, and, uh, and loss of vit vitality, we would also see lots of cascading effects, which uh, Andrea already uh, uh, hinted on. Um, maybe, maybe just uh, to, to close on this question, uh, in my own career, when I started to look at these issues uh, some uh, uh, 30 years ago, we completely underestimated the, the effect of climate change. Partly due to the fact that uh, climate models were not really made to produce uh, weather extreme events. They had uh, different purposes. They were calibrated to replicate millennia rather than being good on, on, on climate and climate weather extremes uh, like droughts and floods. And uh, now, since we see more and more of those uh, happening in reality, and the models improved, we also see that uh, uh, there will be way more degradation uh, ahead of us as we anticipated. And uh, what's actually quite interesting, when you look at uh, the uh, objective of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, it's basically, it basically tells us we should select uh, or choose uh, a concentration of CO2 or greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in order that uh, natural ecosystems can adapt uh, uh, autonomously. And I think 
uh, this is uh, a condition we are about to violate uh, rather soon. We are actually in the face of climate change, uh, degrading, uh, degrading uh, uh, ecosystems on, on very large scales. So, so here, uh, I think we have to, from now on, really go more into um, more systemic changes uh, and live with climate overshoot and the climate overshoot uh, phenomena and subsequent uh, environmental degradation and with the degradation all the ecosystem services from which we draw from uh, might actually be also quite compromised mm -hmm. great well thank you so much but, but michael from, from a scientific point of view um how, how does environmental degradation or how do environmental degradation and climate change impact conflict um well this is uh, this yes. is uh, this is a really really interesting question and quite contested so, so uh, there's one body of literature that actually points to the statistic linkage between uh, environmental degradation climate change uh, and conflict however many times uh, the the actual you know the, the the causality is actually not so easy to establish and actually have then kind of scientifically robust uh, testing of the causality that's uh, that's uh, that's still still in the making i would say however we have ample evidence uh, of uh, 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 more descriptive uh, uh, phenomena and uh, which go back all the way to to paleoclimatic uh, uh, conditions so where where the maya culture but also northern american culture where where this is very well described how uh, climate impacted uh, the corn yields in this case uh, led to cultural shifts of uh, behavior and then all ended in, in in larger conflicts and basically to the decline of entire cultures um, and more recently and, and andrea also hinted on this uh, already we have also plenty of examples and probably the best characterized one is uh, is syria where uh, we know that uh, there was a buildup of uh, vulnerability of society overall, mostly related to seven years of droughts uh, in Syria, where actually many, many farmers went out of business and actually were fleeing from the rural areas into the cities. However, in the cities, you also have had migrants from other uh, regions uh, like uh, Palestinians. And so here you actually had uh, a huge uh, labor market uh, problem in the country already. And uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, the, the food price crisis came as a trigger. So you had, had already a, a system which was vulnerable to to flip, so to say, and uh, and uh, and we all know what uh, what happened afterwards, and we are still uh, we are still in conflict uh, simply because we couldn't really repair uh, uh, a a functioning social system, but also we could not repair uh, the the very the, the 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 natural assets in order to to provide more fundamental stability to uh, to to the country so so here um we see that uh, uh, it's not a very bright future because uh, when we look at uh, the outcome of uh, of uh, of the cop it's very likely that we do over we, we go for overshoots we are just coming out from a major drought uh, uh, following uh, floods in, in Pakistan, and Pakistan is for sure also one of these uh, future hotbeds, uh, uh, which uh, where we have a chronic conflict uh, with uh, the, the neighboring countries. And, uh, and that's certainly something uh, we will see more and more in the world overall. But in this particular case, uh, I think it's, it's time to put up uh, an early warning system to actually see how, how these, these conflicts might, uh, might, might or might not involve and how can we bring more stability uh, to to uh, to in this case Pakistan and when I look at uh, 
what's currently happening in terms of um, real follow-up from the international community, uh, we can definitely conclude that we don't take the risk of conflict very serious and its conflict uh, uh, implications. Right. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, Dr. Marili Marakudi is the director of the G20 Global Land Initiative based in Bonn. Um, can I ask you, in, in your experience to date, where have you seen environmental degradation and security issues overlap? Thank you, um, Andrew. Um, I, uh, as you mentioned, I now lead the G20 Global Initiative on Land Restoration in um, here in Bonn at the UNCCD. And you know, we are just about to start our work. But prior to joining the UNCCD, for the last 20 years, I have been working at the United Nations Environment Program, where we um, at the conflicts and disasters team. And I had opportunity to work in virtually every conflict, um, every major conflict of the 21st century, starting from you know, Afghanistan in 2002, all the way to Ukraine before I left. And to me, uh, the question is, where have I seen climate impacting? It's more like where I have not seen climate not impacting conflict. And um, to be honest, when I started work in 2002, uh, there was not so much of a talk about climate change and security. I think that's a relatively new time, probably in the 2010s. And that time it was more like the Middle East and the water wars and water will be the new thing, you know, et cetera. And now that lens has slightly changed to move into climate change. And analyzing each of these conflict from Afghanistan all the way to the Syria example, which was mentioned um, to Ukraine, but what is obvious is that it's not that climate change is causing a conflict in a certain location. That's very unlikely. And I don't think I will attribute any war specifically to conflict. What happens is that climate change act as, a, uh, as an aggravator to an existing fissure which exists. And that you can see across the board. Andrea, mentioned about um, Haiti and my colleague, I think and Adelphi will talk about the work they did with UNEP um, in Sudan and Nepal. So I wouldn't, I would skip those stories, but um, Andre mentioned about Haiti, where I have been working since 2008, when we went um, up and when we went primarily because of other ongoing co conflict, which already existed there to see how we can create a sustainable future. In 2010, major earthquake happened and of course you know close to 200,000 people died and then we worked on the post disaster context and then slowly the insecurity started happening and then hurricane matthew happened so in 2010 to 2015 as the security situation in haiti was getting worse we moved to the south governor governorate Port Salut, you know, Lekai, et cetera. And this was supposed to be the, the safe place, comparatively speaking, where security was uh, lacking. But then Hurricane Matthew happens, the livelihood of the local community gets wiped out. The beaches get wiped out. And you know, again, as Michael said, there's a question of attribution, whether Hurricane Matthew, Matthew is because of climate change, but clearly, it is now well understood that there are more hurricanes in this world. There is sea level rise, uh, rise happening and also coral bleaching. So all this <laughs> combined meant that people in the south of Haiti had a livelihood challenge, which meant migration to the cities, but also more insecurity in the south. So it's very, it's very obvious there that climate change is playing a role in Haiti, particularly in South of Haiti, which is leading to insecurity and local conflict. And we could unpack any other conflict ongoing and we can see these type of trends. Thank you. Right, thank you. Do, thank you. Do, do you have any examples of 
responses that work across different fields, development, climate, humanitarian, or peace. And, and what do we need to do to make sure that the actors can effectively work together? Increasingly, this is understood. You know, the, the UN system's response, um, the peace um, building assessment, the rapid needs assessment, they are all now looking through the climate lens so that the response is not just humanitarian response is not just you know giving people houses and blankets and food but looking at the underlying causes so at least the un system un system in the humanitarian architecture has understood this is clearly the way to go we will of course need to work at two levels one is that we have to reduce the underlying causes of these type of issues, better adapt to that situation. For example, if it's in Haiti, clearly in the soil, erosion of topsoil, loss of beaches, and associated livelihood loss is a clear reason. So we have to address that. But at the same time, we also have to work on the social cohesion angle concurrently, because only working on one will not solve the other. And this is why Andrew also mentioned about the work you know, being done in the Great Green Wall, where you are restoring the ecosystem in one, one place, creating employment. And of course, you should you need a lot more activity in terms of uh, bringing people together, you know, better grievance mechanisms, redressal mechanisms, and so on. And I can see this type of thing happening you know, in Nepal, for example, but I, I assume maybe Janani might talk about it, but otherwise I can come back to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that brings me to Janani, who is the head of the Climate Diplomacy and Security at Adelphi, where she leads the multilateral climate security risk and is a frequent partner of ours. Janani, um, thank you so much. So what for, what for you are some of the, the risks of adaptation measures that, that people have come up with? Um, in, in these security contexts. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, that's quite a depressing uh, question to start with. Um, the, the risks of adaptation in itself. So, um, so with all of these cascading risks, a multiple uh, of, of these kind of multiple climate, environmental and non-climate and non-environmental risks coming together, it can be really overwhelming and we don't know what we can actually do that doesn't kind of inadvertently affect something else in an adverse way. I think it's maybe helpful to think about this then in terms of pathways. Um, these cascading risks take all sorts of different forms in different contexts, um, but we need a handle on this somehow. So I think thinking about this in terms of pathways can think, help us understand uh, what can be done, but also how to kind of look for what could be uh, going wrong. Um, so maybe within the frame of this conversation, it's helpful to think about maybe four pathways uh, to outline some of the different ways that climate change, environmental degradation uh, and biodiversity loss interact with conflict and human security and peace. Um, I won't go through them in much detail, but just to kind of set them out to then give an example of how we can get it wrong in trying to deal with one part without then thinking about the other parts of the pathway. So the first would be around uh, ecosystem and biodiversity loss and how that can affect livelihood and security and political instability um, that was uh, outlined earlier. The second is around uh, environment conflict financing and organized crime. Again, something that uh, is, a, is an important pathway um, that Ms. Morio outlined in, in um, the, the, the dry corridor in, in Central and uh, South America. The third is around competition and conflicts around natural resources and the fourth is the impacts of war and conflict on the environment like as you set out Andrew in your your introductory remarks so the first um the first pathway climate and environmental changes increasingly disrupt food water energy land and these are the things that are the basis of livelihoods of billions of people around the world but it's not just the climate and environmental impacts that can uh, be destabilizing it's also some of our responses to them not just on the climate and environmental side but also on the peace and security side so many of the people that are most vulnerable to these climate and environmental impacts are also uh kind of facing this double vulnerability of climate and environmental degradation and conflict and some of uh 
our peace building or stabilization measures are really poorly planned when it comes to thinking about climate uh, resilience, climate adaptation, or indeed people's ability to mitigate. So to give an example, uh, our work in, in the Lake Chad region found that a lot of the military responses are kind of focused on this uh, neutralizing the enemy by any means. And there's a lot of use of things like scorched earth tactics, you know, just raising uh, fields and villages to the ground to smoke out uh, armed groups or opposition um, actors. And this, of course, totally undermines people's livelihoods. And, and we found that this actually, the, the loss of livelihoods and the, uh, the real um, kind of grievance, the frustration that people felt really fueled anti-government sentiment uh, because it was leaving people more vulnerable than before. And it really kind of pushed them towards illegal and criminal activities. In, in some cases, this is what people cited. These kind of military responses were the reasons people cited for joining armed groups and terrorist groups that these stabilization efforts were designed to protect them against. Um, the another pathway around environment and conflict financing organized crime where there's a real risk here as well around mal maladaptation um around this kind of new thing new category of conflict minerals um environmental crimes can often form a central part of political economies of conflict kind of locking in uh conflicts because there's a real kind of war economy which makes it more profitable to keep a conflict going um and these environmental climate crimes often directly involve the exploitation of natural resources um and they really provide financial incentives for for actors to 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 stand in the way of peace for spoilers um now we, we of course need to push for greater and more urgent climate action but we mustn't let this urgency uh mean that we're going to run without um learning to walk i guess uh we, we shouldn't lose sight of the how how we do this and this has to be done in a conflict sensitive way so we can really see a risk of new war economies growing up around things like critical minerals needed for ev batteries things like lithium nickel cobalt things that are often um uh, are found in in contexts which are mineral rich but governance poor places like drc uh where there are are very little controls over kind of land rights over um mining and extraction and we can see that without um equitable governance uh there there's a real scope for these becoming the new kind of conflict minerals over which um conflicts can be kind of locked in um the third pathway around biodiversity loss and environmental degradation uh, we know about how this can have severe uh, impacts on the availability uh, of and access to natural resources, um, as previous speakers have outlined. But again, in terms of the unintended consequences of our climate actions, um, it's not just kind of environmental degradation and climate change um, in the kind of natural cycle, as it were, but also uh, some of our responses to adaptation and mitigation um, that can compound this uh, to give another example um, renewables so solar uh, wind um, they need a lot of land you need uh, a lot of water to cool down um, photovoltaic plates and um, even offsetting schemes like tree planting whenever we fly those trees need to be planted on land and when you look uh, carefully about where some of these um, uh, adaptation or mitigation actions are happening. They may be happening in places where um, these resources, the land and the water are cheap and easy to procure from, from governments who are amenable to overlooking customary land rights, for example. Uh, so selling off customary land for in return for FDI um, so that company X can plant um, however many trees. But of course, if that land was there and an important part, part of uh, local uh, traditional um, mechanisms for grazing or, uh, or, or sharing the, the resource between pastoralists and farmers um, during different seasons, that can create tension. Similarly, you know, if, if land is being kind of sold to um, to energy companies for solar or wind turbines when um, this was customary land again used by 
communities who don't necessarily have formal rights but had um, had a customary rights, rights to that land, this can be problematic. And it's especially a, a, an issue where, for example, in some of the uh, solar schemes where there was, uh, I think, I can't remember um, what it's called now, Desert X, I think, uh, where the, I think it failed because the land that was used for energy, none of that energy was going to the communities whose land it, it had traditionally been, uh, but rather it was being shipped over to Europe. So if there's no kind of equitable resource sharing um, with those who had previously had access to that land, then that can be conflictual. Um, so just to underscore Ms. Maria's point at the beginning, it's not just an environmental agenda. We really need to also remember this is a human rights based approach. Um, it's about people and we need to ensure that the kind of human rights and human security as angle is still there to ensure that this is a just transition and it really does contribute to or at least doesn't roll back to uh, roll back prospects for peace. Thank you. Um, I don't know about you, Janani, but we, we find, um, I don't know if that will be the same, that there is relatively few resources, either multilateral or bilateral, going into those worst affected countries, um, which worst affected by environmental degradation and worst affected by conflict. Um, but if there was more, and one hopes there will be, there, do, what, what do you see as the main entry points for UN fund programs, et cetera, or, or indeed other, other agencies? So. Yeah, thanks, uh, Andrew. I mean, I don't want this to be too negative. So, I mean, we do live in this doomsday world of risks, but if you take one thing away, I think it's about the uh, take away the entry points and the 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 pathways of providing opportunities of what we can do. Um, you mentioned, you know, th the resources. I think there is a real opportunity to better align our our financial flows um so by aligning climate and um, peace and stabilization finance uh financial flows we've got a much better chance um to hit some of these kind of uh, double dividends if we can make sure that the um climate fin financing that was pledged at cop for example um is conflict sensitive um, and can um, do no harm, then there's a real chance that this this finance uh, financing that's been earmarked for climate can be much more efficient. We can maximize the impact of these limited resources uh, and also provide entry points for this kind of bottom up cooperation on climate action through some of these peace building entry points, which then enables us to build resilience against both climate and conflict risk. So I think that there is still that hope in, in me that we can get to this kind of double dividend. But in terms of concrete entry points, I think if we look at this kind of pathway approach, it helps us identify some of the um, entry points for different agencies across different remits. We know that this, uh, this is complex, it's compound. We need to work in synergy and promote cooperation we need to work in integrated ways and foster mutual exchange but I kind of feel um I feel bored just saying it because we know this we know that we need to work across different bodies across different mandates uh, but the thing is the how so I think let's be pragmatic and and acknowledge that different agencies have their their siloed mandates and just find the spaces within those mandates to address some of these things. So I, I, I think it's really specific for the different agencies, but I'll just give a couple of examples of some of the, the UN agencies um, that we've been working with or I've been working with. Um, I'll start with the UN Security Council, given that there was a, a, a debate just, uh, was it yesterday, the day before yesterday, on climate and security. Um, I've been working with members of the UN Security Council since uh, about 2011 to try to promote the integration of climate into UN peace and security architecture. Um, but I've been kind of baffled about the artificial distinct, distinction between climate change and environment in the kind of furthering of this climate security agenda. Um, so I think there's a real uh, importance to not siphon off environment as the climate and security agenda progresses. So the UN Security Council could, for example, successively expand its action on climate related security risks to address the full breadth of links between environment, conflict and peace, um, and also address this environment, climate security nexus as part of its UN op peace operations as it moves forward with the, the better integration of climate security into um, its agenda. Um, I think Marilyn, we touched on um, the kind of 
the need for humanitarian agencies to think beyond this Im immediacy to the longer term given the, the fact that humanitarian aid can be very detrimental to kind of longer term environmental and climate um, resilience. So uh, if I look at the World Food Programme, uh, we're working with the World Food Programme in the Horn of Africa and you can see that they're, they're trying to move from this kind of saving lives agenda to changing lives. And something they can concretely do or continue to do is to continuously strengthen their focus or the focus on avoiding harm by guaranteeing that both emergency aid but also the longer term support doesn't unintentionally increase environmental and conflict related challenges by ensuring that that's a kind of a lens and a filter on all their food systems programming uh, for example by um, looking at other things that they do beyond just emergency food aid provision looking at say supply chains and food procurement practices as agents of change in fragile states and fragile contexts um, and using this as a means to strengthen vulnerable livelihoods and foster land regeneration and, and environmental protection um, just a couple of, of other quick examples UNEP has a really critical role um, it can expand its integrated nature and security programming uh, to integrate environmental or climate action within peace building and conflict prevention um, and continue to be this kind of um, lab laboratory within the UN, UN system to test new approaches. And I think the peace building commission can use its advisory role um, and its kind of bridging role to try and really push for integrated action across the UN system. So I think there are opportunities, there are entry points, but they will be very specific to specific agencies. Sure. No, no, well, thank you. Um, back to you, Michael. And I was wondering if you have any ideas on how science could be engaged to support adaptation to, to those countries in, in conflict areas, uh, to, to the crisis in conflict areas, and what would need to be done to in, enable the knowledge transfer to them? You're, you're on mute, by the way. Sorry, um, uh, I'm really thankful for the discussion. It's a very rich discussion, uh, which we had up to now. Uh, and uh, and uh, I can probably just directly build on it. It might sound uh, a little little theoretically sometimes, uh, but uh, but uh, it's it's unavoidable when we, we talk about uh, the science contribution. So I, I think one and the, and the first one is, is really to get to a better understanding of, uh, of this uh, complex web of climate change, environmental degradation, which in the end leads then to, to conflict. And here, um, there has been in the last 10 years, quite a lot of progress in complex system science. And complex system science, uh, fundamentally what it is, it, it, uh, it is uh, a mixture of game theory. So basically, how do you, how do agents strategically interact uh, in combined with population dynamics, so human population dynamics of different, let, let's say, levels of trust. And how do you establish rules in their interaction of like level of trust uh, between humans in the interaction of building peace at the same time, which is a public good, as well as the public goods that are fundamental, like the provision and systems, which we discussed, like food provision, uh, water, safe water provision, and so forth. So here, there's a lot of... Uh, um, uh, science done currently uh, that could, and I can see how this could actually translate to help then, for example, uh, uh, what Janini just mentioned, how can you bring all of these different parties together? Uh, and uh, uh, science could play a strong role, especially now since we have a uh, uh, digital twin twinning capabilities where we can build digital twins of the environment but also digital twins of population dynamics and human behavior dynamics that actually leads them to conflicts and once you play this out 
uh, in a, a game setting, if you want, uh, with stakeholders, then you might actually come up uh, with very good ideas on planning to prevent conflict, but also maintain a, a better environment. Um, the, the, other, the other issue I see, which is uh, I haven't seen really implemented yet, but which uh, science really uh, brings to the table is the measurement of uh, systemic risk. And one systemic risk is then uh, risk that leads to conflict. And here we could do a much better job to do to develop early warning systems of uh, of uh, con conflict emerging, taking a you know uh, a network based big data approach uh, to some of uh, those things. Of course, you know we 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 are quite good as humans already on foreseeing conflict, so to say, but we can be quite much smarter and uh, and more precise. Uh, and then, of course, uh, once we have a better understanding and better measurement and early warning systems, uh, we could also come up uh, with much more effective uh, intervention planning. Um, uh, maybe uh, another issue I would like to mention that comes uh, out originally of science uh, is uh, uh, solution instruments. Uh, and I, I just want to, to mention one is, uh, so in, in the field of disaster risk reduction, uh, we are talking about uh, a lot of uh, pre-disaster financing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and there are very specific uh, um, financial tools that need to be priced and characterized where, where where science is really really needed, and would one could use very a very similar disaster risk reduction approach to actually uh, uh, come up with. Uh, even financial instruments that could help us uh, prevent or reduce the uh, uh, risk of uh, conflict arising. So, so here we would just have to borrow one concept and implement it for, for the other. Um, the, the other thing I think which is developing also quite nicely uh, uh, and came out of, uh, of, uh, of science already and is now implemented more and more by banks, central banks is stress testing. And I think uh, we could actually think about, uh, especially when we now start to deploy uh, larger sums of money of uh, climate adaptation through uh, these new instruments that were now created uh, at the last COP and, uh, and then some of the previous COPs, where we not only uh, disperse funds to uh, for climate adaptation, but actually perform additional stress tests on how those those funds would contribute to the reduction of conflict uh, uh, of conflict risk, and then um, probably just uh, just in, in as my my last uh, thought on 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 this question is is really about uh, coming back to these to these digital twins, um, which. Uh, could actually serve uh, multiple multiple um, benefits in uh, uh, conflict reduction um, in terms of uh, how do we if we if you have a digital twin of the environment the social interactions and a characterization how this leads to to conflict um, and we could play dynamic games and establish uh, uh, realistic uh, scenarios we could be much much better identifying uh, more effective intervention points uh, which was already mentioned uh, but where i see a much larger value and i, I mentioned this early on is really the, the bringing all of the different parties onto the table to something which is a digital twin which is way more in sense than a, a real conversation about uh, a conflict and before the conflict really pains out. Um, and so, so here we could really uh, have a much better understanding of uh, how can restoration activities, for example, or agricultural reforms uh, really contribute uh, as a tool to peacemaking rather than uh, uh, serving uh, serving serving other purposes. So maybe maybe I, I, I stop here, uh, but I'm I'm super happy to to contribute more on uh, what science could play. But those are just a few reflections.
Well, well, following on from that last point, actually, could I come from early uh, on, Michael, your, your point about how important it is that restoration programs don't uh, contribute to making things worse. Um, Murali, either from the UN's perspective or, 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 or even more broadly, do you see ways in which we can in, try to ensure that, um, how can we do that to ensure that environmental restoration programs don't make conflict worse or, or indeed conversely can actually make things better? <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. Actually, a number of major restoration programs are about to take off. The Great Green Wall, uh, which has been spoken about since 1970s, I think 2005, they already had their association. But I think for the first time in recent history, there it's getting real momentum with real fund commitments um, of up to $19 billion. At the recently concluded COP, the government of Saudi Arabia came up with this new Middle East or Afro-Asian green initiative span, you know, initially with uh, about a dozen countries, but eventually going to 46 countries uh, across Asia and Africa. So there are major restoration projects in the offing. And these restoration projects themselves have the potential uh, to create additional problem for a number of reasons, which Janani also mentioned, for example, um, where do you restore and whose land do you restore and who actually gets the benefit of restoration. And restoration is often seen as planting trees. And you know when you try to plant trees in a place where it's already have other uses for water or water stress, then you actually exacerbate a water problem, but also an associated problem with conflict. So what we are planning to do in our uh, global initiative, which we are about to start, is to work on these uh, two levels. One is to do a global opportunity mapping, building on the work of IUCN and the World Resource Institute, where they looked at where are the opportunity for forest and landscape restoration, but to add a climate change DRR and security angle to it. So of the possibility of investing resources for restoration, which area slash locations would have maximum additional benefits in addition to just you know, carbon sink or livelihood? And so that's one way in which we can look at using restoration as a way of conflict reduction. The other one is to actually look at where what people are trying to do and see if they are going to aggravate the situation. So this we'll be working with both this initiative, which I mentioned, both the Great Green Wall as well as the Middle East Green Initiative to see, to, to frame it, to link it through a, um, a, a conflict, um, water stress type of lens and see whether these are uh, going to aggravate the existing situation. And as uh, Janani said, it could lead to a maladaptation type of situation. And the scientific tools actually exist. I don't think it's the tools itself are the problem. The issue is often we are more fascinated by the number of trees, a billion tree and a 10 billion tree and a trillion tree and so on and so forth. And then you chase um, those numbers relentlessly, regardless of what are the social and economic benefits of it, but also the potential cost to cause, uh, potential to cause additional damage. So once we were to use the best available science to look at what are the best opportunities for restoration and also look at how restoration could lead to further conflict, I think there is a way to ensure that the new level of investment, which is happening and could happen from this nature-based solution type of climate investment to lead to a safer world. Thank you. Thank you. So um, actually, I have more questions, but equally, we, we've received a few. Um, and uh, and I, I might just put, put one to the group. Anyone welcome to have a go at it. What do we know about the 
the disaggregated effects of environmental degradation and climate change along the lines of gender and urban rural areas? And how must ad mitigation and adaptation strategies be tailored to different groups and areas? Would anyone like to have a go at that one? If I could pick it up and uh, oh, if I, uh, I'm not sure if I understand correctly, if it, um, if it is about unpacking and having some level of attribution of a certain conflict and say 20% of this conflict is due to climate change and 30% is due to gender, etc., then obviously it is, science is not there yet. And in my opinion, it's not even direction where science should spend a lot of time trying to understand it that way. I don't think I don't think it was actually I don't think it's about attribution. It's about the effects of environmental change. Uh, how um, what do we know about the disaggregated effects? So it's, it's not I, I don't think the questioner was talking about attribution, but more of, about the impact of, of of environmental degradation, climate change along uh, gender gap. Grants, gender distinctions. Hmm. Yeah. And again, uh, you know, <clears throat> maybe I'm not getting getting it right. Um, so, you know, as I, you know, there are enough evidence, and there are multiple studies, including the work done by UNEP, as to how many of the conflicts have an environmental um, footprint or or an, an environmental fingerprint in them. That, I think that part of science is actually very uh, well known and well developed, but um, going and how much this conflict damaged the environment, I think that's even better documented that uh, UNEP actually since 2001 has been studying every conflict, including the one which is in Ukraine, where what are the environmental impacts of conflicts also um, well documented. Um, but as I mentioned, the attribution part is not uh, yet uh, very well developed. Thank you. Yeah. Can I also jump in, Please. Andrew? Um, Please. Just to add to that, I think it, it, it's a great question. I think it's very difficult to generalize, um, but it's in, it's so important to understand whose risk we're talking about. There's no homogenous experience of these risks, and um, to have a an intersectional, dis intersectionally disaggregated. Uh, approach to understanding this is really important, not just um, to understand how um, how these are experienced, but also to ensure that the responses are are targeted. So along gender lines, yes, absolutely, um, but also along kind of age, that so a lot of these risks are felt in different ways across different generations, mm -hmm. and of course the implications are different for different generations, particularly in the sub-Saharan Africa where youth feel um, very um, marginalized and, and already excluded from political processes. They are um, facing uh, unemployment because particularly amongst the, um, the, the poorest and, and therefore most dependent on kind of uh, uh, agrarian livelihoods. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to look at this in, in this disaggregated way, um, but it's not just a, on kind of gender lines, but we've got to see it across this intersectional framework. Um, to give an example, um, uh, a lot of the implications of uh, of this, I think that the, the impact on women has been well documented, but a lot of these um, climate impacts on livelihoods affect masculinities and this can affect, you know, if uh, I draw on the, the Lake Chad work that I was part of again, um, it, undermining of people's ability to, or young men's ability to uh, have an income to be able to afford a bride price to get married uh, undermines masculinities, which you can try to address by providing a new livelihood, but it's it's much more complex than that. And, and of course, uh, criminality and joining an armed group can um, can kind of bolster that in a way that just a kind of a, a cash for work program cannot. So we have to understand this in in these really complex um, 
uh, ways in which climate and environmental impacts are affecting all sorts of kind of social dynamics. Also in terms of um, religious and ethnic um, lines as well, not just in terms of climate impacts, but also in terms of who's getting um, who's getting support and aid uh, when I was working on the flood response in Pakistan and in, in Sindh province, um, there was a real, um, a, a huge national push to, to ensure that people were getting flood relief. It was impressive, but it was very uh, ethnically divisive because um, there were certain ethnic groups that were not able to access this, uh, the, the, the aid because they were, in this case, it was, they were Punjabi. Uh, and so uh, un not understanding, you know, who is where um, means that we don't understand uh, we or who, who um, has access to kind of the political economy of both the climate impacts, but also the, cli the, the aid responses um, can really hinder us in, um, in getting our responses right. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got one question. Um, uh, we've got several questions, but one I wanted to ask now is, are democracies inherently more resilient to climate conflict linkages than authoritarian regimes? Um, my answer for what it's worth is categorically yes, because you cannot actually be resilient. You cannot respond to climate and environmental degradation if there isn't free circulation of information and if governments aren't willing to share it with their citizens and if there isn't a free debate and if one can't actually raise questions to one's government either at local or national level as to why they aren't taking measures so I, that would be my answer does anybody um, want to uh, expand or, or do you say something different to that answer about democracies mm, yeah i i can i can come in on this one um we did a, an econometric analysis a few years ago um, where we looked at uh, the impact of uh, natural disasters on long-term economic growth. And uh, what came out of this, and this is statistical analysis, uh, so not necessarily 100% causal, um, but what we found was uh, that there are, there's basically a threshold when countries are too poor and they're hit by a natural disaster, a drought or a flood, then they actually go into an underdevelopment trap. If countries are above a certain threshold uh, of uh, economic performance, then they go actually, they, then it's actually, you in the long run, boosting economic growth, which is quite interesting. So, so you have kind of a contraction convergence uh, and you have some really going into an underdevelopment trap. And uh, when we went into additional exploratory, uh, explanatory variables, we actually found that exactly democracy and openness of the country was a very strong determinant whether you went into a, an, a long and economic growth path or whether you went uh, into uh, uh, into the underdevelopment trap. And uh, the reason we gave back then was that democracies, uh, once a, a, a disaster happens, uh, first of all, you 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 allow for for foreign help to come in, but with the foreign help, you also have institutional reforms, uh, which are long lasting, and you appropriate uh, uh, new technologies to come in as, as well. So so it's it's both kind of a technology transfer, but then also an, a, a local institutional reform that makes you more resilient for further disasters hitting you later on. So so we call this in the end. Uh, um, a phenomenon of creative destruction, which uh, uh, disasters uh, and uh, and most of them are actually climate related disasters uh, can actually play in this and therefore uh, democracy and good governance uh, is uh, is an asset you need to have and you need to build in order to be resilient. Right, thank you very much. Um, we, we had a question about well, it related to Pakistan and the floods and the melting of the glaciers. And the question is, are we ignoring indigenous knowledge? Because there, the inhabitants of the regions up in the north, the Gilgit, Baltistan, are adopting ancient practice of glacier marriage. Um, would you say that we are ignoring and what, what any other views on indigenous? I think Andrea might be very good at this question, but I, th I think she had to leave us. But um, anybody else would like to answer that? Maybe I can start and others could contribute. I um, I don't think we are ignoring as a, as a system. I 
you know, as early as 2003, UNEP had a publication called Indigenous Knowledge for Disaster Risk Management. So the um, international community had understood that there are indigenous knowledge which could be used for management of disaster, especially on slow onset disasters, which they are very good at, such as drought. Yesterday, we were organizing a webinar with the European Commission on land restoration, and a similar question was asked about indigenous knowledge. And we looked around and so, uh, asked, is there a global repository of best practices on restoration and indigenous knowledge? Now, we are aware of global best practices of restoration, but not specifically of indigenous knowledge. We are aware of a lot of national level repositories of indigenous knowledge, but not necessarily specific to restoration. So one of the conclusion which we made yesterday was that pro probably there's a room for something like that. So you know, for, I was looking at the question and probably there's, a, you know, it is right that somebody is looking at from a developing country may not see that their knowledge is actually being picked up and systematically projected the way modern science is picked up and projected. And I think it is only fair that we have such a system in place where traditional knowledge are compiled at least and put through a, a screening to see if they measure up to modern science. Because in my mind, there isn't two science. There is only one science, whether it, the science came from traditional knowledge, came, science came from, from the university, they all have to meet the same requirements of science. But having a systematic process and a global repository would be very helpful. And as I said, as early as 2003, UNEP had a publication. Maybe it's time that we revisited it in the context of the emerging risk. Thank you. I just add to that as well. I think there's um, it, it's incredibly important to to not um, not foreground uh, kind of natural science over um, indigenous knowledge. I, I agree with Morelli that there's no, there's only one science, um, but it's also important to recognise that with the pace of climate change. Um, the future just doesn't look like the past and the the knowledge that's come before um, it, it, it won't necessarily serve us and particularly in fragile states where a lot of this indigenous knowledge has been lost because of generations of conflict and so in, if you look at places like Nepal, um, the knowledge of indigenous farmers is lost because they've had decades of rice as food aid so people do not know about what was cultivated during drought years um because the you know the food aid agencies have been shipping in um subsidized rice so a lot of this knowledge has been lost so we'll let, i think it's more important not to kind of uh put too much of a focus on this because in fragile states we can't always draw on it and um and also the fact that the rate and, and nature of change is so different that some of it will just not be uh, be uh, valid anymore. So, of course, there's a lot that can be used, but to just give a quick example, um, there was some really good uh, early warning um, put in place in, um, in East Africa that, that they could see that there were going to be floods in Mozambique. The Limpopo uh, water table had risen hugely upstream that um and the uh, local authorities were able to get to a community downstream and warn them that the, the floods are coming we need to evacuate um let's go guys and people didn't move because they said well we look at the ants and when the ants come up we leave and the ants are down so we're not leaving what they didn't know is that the intensity of rainfall was so um so high that the ants it hadn't gone down to that 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 uh, level of um, absorption where the ants would start to rise. So the people stayed because the ants hadn't risen. Also, they didn't trust the, the local government. So that, that played into things too. Uh, so they didn't trust the service providers and the indigenous knowledge didn't serve them. And then this did lead to uh, preventable death because people did not evacuate. So I think mm -hmm. it's it's important to, to draw on both and not kind of focus on one over the other. Yeah, um, maybe 
I can also share an anecdote on uh, on uh, my own experience with indigenous uh, uh, peoples, and and this was uh, uh, so. Now in Brazil, we will most likely, with the new government, have a, a, a ministry for indigenous affairs. So so this will be uh, quite uh, quite uh, will have quite a significant uh, impact. But I remember we were doing, and we are still doing, quite a lot of work on. Uh, um, advising the Brazilian government on their strategies to curb deforestation uh, and uh, with uh, the forest code and so forth. And in the consultation, um, we were pointed by the indigenous communities that we should look into the benefit of uh, forests that it actually brings rain and, uh, and and will be beneficial for agriculture and this was not at all our our highest priority and we thought you know we will uh, basically save the forest through carbon markets uh, and carbon incentives and command control issues uh, and now once we went through the exercise and did the science of it we actually see that some of the largest benefits to brazil overall uh, for uh, the fact of having standing forests there and actually engage in additional restoration is to the benefit of agriculture to, to, to produce more. So here that the, the local and regional benefits of standing forests uh, uh, actually outweighs the in, in, in economic benefits, uh, the, the, the international inflow needed in order to protect the, the forest in terms of carbon money, and this this was this came to a surprise of the, to us, uh, and is basically grounded in indigenous knowledge and intuition. Okay, now thank you so much. I mean, could I have maybe Janani? We've got a question. We we have more than one level of uh, of questions coming in. Uh, we got one for you. Um, what role can peace and security actors play in supporting adaptation and how can they work together concretely with the environmental actors? That's actually a very, very good question of great interest to me. That I'd love to hear what you, you have to say, Janani. Uh, it's a great question. It's a huge question. Uh, let me try and think of an example. Um, it, there's definitely a, a significant role. I think one thing I'd say is um, if you look at the amount of resourcing, um, there's a lot of money going into uh, peacekeeping missions, into stabilization missions. So if, if they're the, 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 those resources are not kind of climate proof, then there's um, a real risk that those kind of stabilization and peace building efforts can undermine people's climate resilience. But of course, the flip side, the positive side is that if we understand uh, the right way of doing it, we can find these opportunities for um, kind of peace building through uh, sustain sustainable environmental practices. So I think there's there's all sorts of opportunities. I think there, there's um, kind of very micro level examples of, um, for example, using, uh, we're just developing this with the World Food Programme, using kind of food systems programming, uh, which is drawing on uh, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge around land restoration, um, to not just focus on increasing yields, but to increase um, productivity of land and how that can then have a positive impact on peace where it's uh, a practice that's being adopted in uh, areas where there are tensions between uh, sedentary farmers who have been farming there um, historically and incomers who where there, there, there was uh, conflicts over stressed resources because traditionally uh, the climate and environmental degradation meant didn't didn't put such a stress on kind of incomers um taking fuel for firewood for example which um because there was enough there was enough to to share and um and it wasn't enough uh it wasn't such a resource drain on the on the host communities to cause conflict now in the face of climate change these the the, the incomers the um the, the idps and refugees in this context are still needing fuel wood because they have got no no way to cook their food but this is then causing conflicts between farmers and host communities and this regenerative uh land use can is uh promoting peace in in these contexts because um it's bringing those hosts and farmers host, host farmers and 
uh, incomes together to find because there's more of, of the resource because of um, better farming practices, they can then share the resource and then have dialogues about uh, natural resource management and sharing together. That's a really micro example. On a more macro level, um, there are examples of how environment mm -hmm. can be a, a space for dialogue and mediation where other issues are quite thorny. This is perhaps a, um, a, an, an area which is outside of kind of already politically drawn lines uh, to bring parties to a table um to kind of uh, promote a political settlement um and importantly just ensuring that um stabilization and peace building measures if you you ensure that they are climate security risk informed by yeah. running them through not just an environmental impact assessment which just looks at the impact of your intervention on the environment now like are you polluting are you um leaving a negative environmental footprint right now but looking if you're looking at your peace building intervention to have a you know decadal timeline looking at what is the climate future in 10 15 years and if you're looking at kind of building a road and then creating livelihoods along that road is this road going to put people in the floodplain in a few years time or is this road going to be totally unusable because there'll be no water uh, because that la that water source is going to dry up um so kind of ensuring that you have climate predictions and, and climate models feeding into um, peace building program design. I'm being uh, inundated with questions from various channels now, but before giving the, the floor, I wanted to give the floor to Michael to, to, to basically sum up and, and make final comments. But before that, Murali, um, of, of the many questions that I thought you wondered if you might give a quick answer to either or both of these. Since there are so many water conflicts worldwide um what, what additional me mechanisms should be included to fully reduce the risk of water conflicts but, and or finally this one um can you offer examples of where land restoration is part of either post-conflict or post-disaster reconstruction thank you andrew <clears throat> because of shortage of time probably i'll go for the second one um as I mentioned, when I was uh, with the UN Environment Program, we had initiated uh, post-conflict and post-disaster um, recovery programs in which land restoration was at the heart. So we were working in Afghanistan, in Bamiyan, where overgrazing had led to uh, denuding of the slopes and the damage from avalanches was on the rise and as, as well as flash floods. So we were working on that particular project by uh, creating a protection forest similar to what they are, have done very successfully in Switzerland to create a barrier between the community and the, uh, and the, uh, the snowfall, which is, is gross avalanche in the absence of a barrier between them. So, in, in so by restoration of the land as well as the landscape, we managed to reduce the disaster risk at that point. We had worked in Sudan, where drought was the major issue, and th therefore it led to um, land degradation. So, by creating micro hydel structures and better water management practices, we could manage to bring back uh, sustainable agriculture in that area. We had worked in, um, in, in DRC Congo, where in the riverine areas where there was significant amount of um, land degradation by deforestation and therefore gull erosion, we managed to recover land by using indigenous knowledge and um, local restoration practices. So there are a number of examples. Each of them are, have turned into a, a publication as well as a, a video, I think five or seven minute video. So there are quite a number of examples um, from vulnerable countries on land restoration in the post-conflict and post-disaster situation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Michael, any concluding thoughts, please? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, what we what we really learned today is um, 
um, one thing, I, and I appreciate this insight really, is that conflict is, is basically a consequence of cascading risks, uh, including cascading risks coming out of uh, environmental degradation and climate change. And, uh, and uh, at least myself, uh, having worked mostly in the climate uh, scene, uh, this is not fully appreciated yet. Um, the, and since it's a cascading risk phenomenon, we actually need to have a more total systems view on uh, on the problem and uh, and really strive for integrated solutions uh, and uh, and here uh, uh, one way to really go for integrated solutions which i see mostly now pioneered in the, in the in, in the finance field is uh, this complex system stress testing and so when we when we actually go for collaborative approaches uh, to avoid conflicts and restore lands uh, it's probably a, a good way to do to get to a, a modern understanding and this is probably a little little self-serving I, I must uh, admit uh, to really go into this digital twinning of uh, 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 major restoration uh, activities uh, or uh, you know nature repair activities uh, where we use digital twins in order to convene people and have a conversation about their joint future and thereby get common understanding what's possible, what's, what is smartest to do for the environment and for, for conflict resolution and, uh, and conflict avoidance uh, in, in a way to get uh, uh, more collective understanding and more warm hearts for the, the, the joint building of uh, better, let's say, uh, environmental and peace landscapes. And I stop here. Well, thank you so much. We, we, it's 3.31. We are ending now. So thank you very much, Michael, for kindly co-organizing this with Berkhoff. Thank you, Murali, Janani, and Andrea for participating and really giving extremely interesting answers to what is a fundamental question. But also thank you for the audience for A, listening and B, sending in very good questions. I really hope that we at Berkhoff and in partnership with, with the other organizations here will take this further. And I'm I'm sure we are going to, and I would love to do it with you as well. So thank you, and thanks finally to the Berkhoff team for doing all the organization of this too. Thank you, and goodbye.